Hi there, thanks so much to everyone who has uh, joined us. My name is Chris Wiebe and I'm with the Bridges Education Group, the umbrella organization for Bridges Academy, Bridges Grad School and uh, TUI News. I'm delighted to welcome you to the second episode of Critical Conversations about Cognitive Diversity hosted by Scott Barry Kaufman. Today our focus is dyslexia and I'd like to thank you all for the questions you submitted to help us plan for the episode today. Our guests are Dr. Fumiko Haft and Dr. Jack Horner. Dr. Horner is a renowned paleontologist who has made important discoveries about dinosaurs and is currently an instructor at Chapman University. Jack is also dyslexic and here to share his uh, story. And uh, Dr. Haft is a professor of uh, psychological science and neuroscience at University of uh, Connecticut. She's also the director of the Laboratory for Learning, Engineering and Neural Systems at UCSF, where she also has a leadership role um, with the Dyslexia Center. So without further ado, Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman. Hi, I don't know if I was gonna get any intro music. <laughs> um, can you see me and hear me? Can you, everyone see and hear me? All good. Great, welcome to Critical Conversations about cognitive diversity. I'm your host, Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman. I'm deeply interested in all things cognitive diversity um, that includes everything on the every, every every single spectrum i care about it all and how uh, extraordinary strengths can combine our topic today is on dyslexia with these two esteemed guests fumiko and jack that um, that chris just uh, just introduced now is it possible for fumiko and jack to start their videos because i don't think their videos are on and i i think uh our guests are very excited to, to see them. There they are, yay! Hey guys, it says it's not just me, you know, that, uh, leaving me stranded, thanks guys. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, really so so great to have you two here today and discuss a topic that I don't, you know, honestly, I don't know that much about, you know, the science of dyslexia. I, I, didn't, I didn't grow up with dys dyslexia. I had many other things I grew up with, but that wasn't one of them. I thought we could start with Jack's uh, early childhood experiences growing up with dyslexia, uh, dys with dys dyslexia and, and, and maybe you can talk a little bit about how those early experiences kind of formed to who you are today. Well, you know, um, dyslexia is a funny thing. <laughs> and I keep saying that. Um, when I was, you know, as as all kids are, when when we're when we're young, you don't know what's wrong with you, but you know you're different. And and I was um, even even in in kindergarten and first grade, even when I was really young, um, it was clear that you know I I couldn't read, even in kindergarten when. They had blo the teacher had blocks and had a bunch of letter it had all the letters on it and what was funny was you know the little letters the b the p the uh the q the you know all those letters that look absolutely identical to one another and they're just it just depends on how you stand them up you, know, you were just totally confused. It was baffling to me because it was one letter. I mean, it was just one thing. And then the teacher would say one, you know, she'd say, this is a D and this is a B. And I'm like, wow, you know, that's the same thing. And then, you know, if it fell over, then it was a P or a Q 
pew or something, you know, I mean, it was just disgusting. It was, it was awful, you know, and, and when I was young, I mean, I was just, I was just totally baffled by stuff like that. And, and, and trying to learn those letters and how to say them and, 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 uh, and how to read them in, in a series. I, I, you know, I just couldn't do it. And, and, uh, you know, I went through first grade and second grade and every, and the teacher would always send this note home with my, with my mother that says, they never said I was, you know, doing terrible. They just kept saying he could really do a lot better. And, you know, my father just thought I was lazy. And, and, you know, it just, it was, it was very difficult. I, you know, I was, it was, I was sad. I cried when I was a little kid. I just, I just really, you know, it was just a horrible experience. But at the same time, you know, school was awful, but at the same time, I would go out in my backyard in the, in a vacant lot behind my house and find fossils. And, and I started a fossil collection when I was very young. I found my, you know, first first fossil when I was four years old, and I found my first dinosaur bone when I was eight, and so I was already I'm putting, so yeah, and I found my first dinosaur skeleton when I was thirteen. What? Like you discovered it in like your backyard or something? Yes, <laughs> very near my backyard. Yes, and so it's incredible. And so, and so you know, there there was this. You know, I was doing terrible in school, and I felt really bad, and I didn't really. I didn't know what to do about it. And I, you know, I was pretty uncoordinated as a kid. I mean, it was just a lot of things wrong. But I think my self-confidence was remained pretty high because I was collecting these cool fossils and I would take them to school and, you know, I could talk to the kids about what they were, my, you know, my friends and stuff. I mean, and, you know, I eventually, you know, built a, a pretty nice collection and and it's even in the it's still in our our city library in shelby montana i mean it's still there <laughs> um Incredible. and then uh, in high school you know i was still doing really poorly getting really bad grades uh, but i was you know a war baby and so all of the you know, our, our class was huge compared to everybody else. So they just kept passing everyone along because there was so many students. And so when I graduated from high school, I had a, the English teacher gave me a D minus, minus, minus. And he said, you know, it, it means you flunked my English class, but we're not going to keep you here. We're just going to let you go. So with your D minus, 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 you know, you're not going to get anywhere in this world, but there you go. You passed, you're, you graduated from high school. So. <laughs> so how did you get into college? Well, fortunately, um, my senior year, I made a, a science project on fossils that I had collected all those years. And and it was a pretty good project and it won the science fair. And, and, and in fact, I won the science fair all four years of high school. I won every science fair that I entered and basically flunked every science class that I took in school. So people were, you know, they just didn't understand it. I mean, I, nobody understood it. I didn't understand it. My mother didn't understand it. My father definitely didn't understand it, but you know, I, I had a whole year to make a science project. I had my, I had as much time as I wanted. And so, you know, I made, I made this incredible project on fossils um, my senior year and it won, it won a bunch of ribbons and I got to go to the state fair and, and uh, People that were judging the state fair were the geologists from the University of Montana, and they invited me to go to college there, even though, you know, I was about to get a D minus, minus, minus in English. And at, fortunately, at that time, Montana um, 
in Montana, you could actually go to college if you had a high school diploma. So I went, you know, and of course the first year in my first year in school, in college, even taking, you know, geology classes and paleontology classes, I failed them. In fact, I, I basically failed every single class I ever took except swimming. I got a, an A in swimming. You got an A in something. It's yeah, something. that's right. <laughs> wow. Do you, you, and you have a PhD. You, you ended up in No, grad. I do not. Uh, I have a high school diploma, though. <clears throat> so you don't, you said you, you never graduated college? I never did. I have two honorary doctorates. One is from the University of Montana. Um, after flunking out seven times, uh, seven different quarters, um, and then getting a job at Princeton University and, and doing some research and publishing some papers, they gave me an honorary doctorate of science. Aren't you a professor right now? I am. At Chapman? So. I am. So one can be a professor without a college degree. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I did get a few other things. I, you know, I, I, I got two honorary doctorates and. Yeah, that's true. And, and I, they gave me a MacArthur fellowship that helped a lot. See, that's the way to do it. <laughs> Kids, don't go to college, get an honorary doctorate. <laughs> um, well, that's amazing. And the MacArthur is the, it's literally your genius. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, who knows what, that means. Wow, what an incredible story. I, I'd like to bring Fumiko in here in a second. Um, you do all this research at, at the generalizable level, right? Like looking at brain scans, looking at uh, in the aggregate, the dyslexic mind and brain and characteristic dyslexia. How do you fit Jack into the framework, the scientific framework of this latest science of dyslexia? Isn't he fascinating? He is. Um, I wish I could say everyone can be like that. Um, it's an, a remarkable story. Um, and I'm always fascinated. It's um, unfortunately, the research is really, really slow to catch up on this. And as you might see in the literature for the past many decades, people have been really fixated on what is the cause of dyslexia and have neglected everything about other important things like the social emotional aspects or persistence or how they feel threatened in schools or feel like they are not doing well um, or that the talents and the creativity that sometimes uh, comes with it like in the case of Jack Horner. And so it's, It's usually funded by the National Institute of Health, which is federal. So they really want to find the cause, the genetic cause, the neural cause. And people have been struggling. The researchers have been struggling for the past many decades. And I think they're starting to realize that we're all starting to realize that we really have to look at the whole child and the whole aspect of it. So now I see a lot of funding kind of coming in for the social emotional aspects, how to promote growth mindset in individuals. I know it's sometimes a controversial term these days among some researchers, but growth mindset has been learned to, uh, we know now that it independently predicts reading outcome. And it's not just reading and language measures that predict success in reading, for example, and these social emotional aspects are very important. And so now finally the federal government is putting in money to do research on this. And so we have a federal grant looking at kind of these um, stereotype threat, for example, in the classroom and how that might kind of uh, decrease their performance. We're looking at compensatory mechanisms. So people who do remarkably well, despite their diagnosis of dyslexia and struggling to read, and also trying to look at um, um, strength-based approaches. So if you combine, if you have weaknesses and strengths, is it better to kind of focus on the strengths or focus on the weakness? The answer is probably both, you need to do both, but how does it look like if you focus on the strengths? So we're just starting that kind of research. And so I don't have the answers and there's more questions, but it's a good sign that the federal agencies and other foundations are very interested in this. And this is for example, funded by the Oak Foundation and one of it is funded by the National Institute of Health. So I think we'll have more answers to how Jack's brains look like uh, in the near future, not quite 
yet. I know some people have looked at Einstein's brains. I was just kind of beating up on the latest on that one. Um, and so there's hints of things everywhere. And I can talk more about the speculation from the evolutionary perspective of the brain, but um, it's still at the speculation level. Did Einstein have dyslexia? Is that why you brought up Einstein? Einstein is suspected to have had dyslexia based on some of the characteristics and it's just kind of speculation. Of course, there wasn't a law that we had to diagnose individuals with dyslexia that only started in the 70s. So it's, it's, we don't really know for sure. Some have speculated that. And so some have been interested in his brain from the perspective of talented visual, spatial and math abilities, but also maybe they thought there might be some clues about language and learning issues related to uh, reading there. I, this is the first I've heard of that, but I'm not surprised because I people attribute all sorts of quotes that he never said to Einstein. And I think they also attribute every learning disability to Einstein as well. <laughs> Einstein got it all. <laughs> uh, so this is very, very interesting. Um, I, I did want to ask the colloquial boring question, which is, is there agreed upon definition of what dyslexia is in the field? Um, and then I want to get to more interesting questions. So let's just get that boring one out of the way. Is there like a technical yes, definition? I can give you the boring answer, but uh, according to the National Institute of Health or the International Dyslexia Association and all these authorities and organizations define it as a brain-based learning disabilities with specific problems in reading. So they have great cognitive abilities, strength in many areas, but they have particular problems in learning to read. And that's a definition. You can see from the word dyslexia, dys is problems or deficits, lexia is related to reading. And, and so that's the definition. So, which also kind of scientifically makes it a little bit harder to say all dyslexics have of talents, even because you define it based on one aspect, which is a problem aspect, then the other strengths and other things are going to be very diverse and there's going to be no one answer to it where so people are going to start looking very different from individual to individual. Well, that's the exact segue into the, the crux of the matter that I wanted to get into. I think it's a little controversial in the field. And I saw that in the, the book I edited, the Twice Exceptional book, where I had you as a contributor, and then I had another researcher of dyslexia as a contributor and, and your chapters couldn't have been any more different in terms of perspective. So it seems like it, it's, uh, there, there's, there's one camp which says, well, if you have dyslexia, you're also gifted, <laughs> you know, like, you know, because you have dyslexia. Mm -hmm. um, it, it comes with all these hit, hit, hidden strengths. Now there's another perspective, which is like, hold up, let's think about this analytically. Um, it's possible to have dyslexia and it's also possible to be gifted. It's possible to have a juxtaposition of those two, but there, there's some where the two come together and there's some humans where they just don't come together. Like they're separate things. How in the world can we scientifically tease that apart and come to an answer on that? Because it, it could be that there, the, the people who, who are, it, it, if we think about it very analytically and logically, it's possible that there are those who are in the Dyslexia means you're a genius camp. Um, they're actually extrapolating from the subset of cases of people who actually just have a comorbidity of dyslexia and genius. You know, like like Jack, it's not that it's, it, it, maybe it's not that it, Jack's dyslexia that made him the genius. It's the it's the fact he's a genius and he has dyslexia. So let's, let's get to the crux of this matter. What does the evidence say about it and how in the world can science tease that apart? Right. And I think, um, so each individual is different. And if everyone were the same and if we were all like Jack Horner, maybe he won't be that special anymore, right? So that's kind of one way to look at it. But I think there's no set answer to this and I'll give you both kind of perspectives. So I think the camp that says um, it's, it's, if you are dyslexic, you have talents and talents can be measured in many different ways. I think the original kind of thinking came from a neurologist, a very famous neurologist called Norm Geshwin who passed away in the eighties, but this was presented um, as, the, the, as the evolutionary perspective of dyslexia. So one would say, if you have reading problems and it seems like it starts from when you're developing um, the, the brain and it starts at a very young age, the really early signs, then, um, so if you think about kind of a problem in one part of the brain, there's a natural compensation or plasticity and reorganization of the brain that makes the area surrounding it or the opposite side of the hemisphere 
different. And so if it's low on one end, you might think about it as a seesaw. I call it the yin yang sometimes, but then the other parts might be more heightened or the surrounding areas. And if you think about the locations of the surrounding area or the opposite side, people think that there might be some visual spatial abilities kind of in, um, in those parts of the brain, the temporal parietal area. So that's why some people said, aha, uh -huh, it makes sense because I see a lot of architects, I see a lot of mathematicians and these kind of things. And you start connecting the dots and you think there's enough evidence. Um, it's not scientifically proven, but it does make sense when you think about the evolutionary perspective of how the brain should be organized. And uh, so that's kind of one camp that has not been proven. One small evidence that we have, we did several years ago, we did a neuroimaging study, we published this. And what we found was we looked at reading abilities and visual spatial abilities. The visual spatial abilities was the Penrose staircase, the impossible stairs, the Escher stairs. And, um, and so basically it was a 3D impossible figure or a possible figure, and they had to judge if that was possible or impossible. And those who are better at this and faster at getting those more accurate were those who tended to be poor readers. So there was this seesaw sort of effect that if you're a better reader, you were not as good in these judgments. And if you were a poor reader, you were a better in those judgments. So it was went like sort of like this. And um, the brain also went sort of like this as well in many areas. And so that was some kind of hint that maybe there is this kind of yin yang relationship. Of course, we don't know if it's a cause that they were born that way and the brain was organized and meant to be, or we don't know if that's because, I mean, I can look at my son as well. He did doesn't like to read or he didn't like to read. And so he would be escaping and running away and playing the Lego all the time, every minute and we had. And we said, oh, since he's happy, he likes doing it. It's not a bad thing. Let's just have him play Legos. So there's him that likes to gravitate toward things he like. So he gets naturally better at those things. And then also then he changes the environment, the parent's perspective and say, let's let him do it since he loves it and he looks happy. And so there's this kind of gene environment interaction possibly as well, that if you fail at one thing, um, then you tend to escape and do other things. Um, and you get better at it because you do a lot of it. And a lot of people say that I don't have talent, but I'm an expert in this because I spent so much time on it and I love doing this. Right? So that's one kind of idea. The other idea is there's a person, business school professor in England called, um, what's her name? Um, Julie Logan, I think. And what she came up with, she had two survey studies. And um, what she found was that she did a survey to individuals um, and uh, found that they, over a third of entrepreneurs had dyslexia traits. And this was survey measure, so it's not as quantitative or methodological in a way, but it was interesting because if you looked at um, more executives of companies, it was much lower. I think it was about five to 10% of the individuals were found to be dyslexia or have that kind of traits in executives versus entrepreneurs, a third. So a very different composition. And people could say which one's chicken or egg, but it was interesting that she replicated it um, again. And the way she framed it was, it's not maybe innate, but it could be because they fail so many times and those who tend to be more resilient and come out. So sprouting from the desert, a plant um, blooming, a flower blooming in the desert and it's sort of that trait. So if you survive, then what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, like the Nietzsche sort of idea. And so it could be because of that, they become talented. And so there's many different pieces that could potentially play a role in that and, and it could, it might as well, it could be true, but more research needs to be done. I'm sorry, it was long, but. It was wonderful. It was just, just what we want here. By the way, I would like to um, encourage all the people in this call to type things in the chat box. Um, we actually, I wanna know that you're alive. Um, so just at least just one person can just, thank you, thank you, that's all. <laughs> I, it's like we, like we wanna know that you're, you're engaged, that you're finding this interesting, that you're here that you're, we're not just in an echo chamber. So that's wonderful. Um, uh, Pumiko, uh, that's really great. And uh, I'm fascinated with this linkage to, um, well, at least we know we got one person engaged, Sheila. Thank you, Sheila. Um, this link to creativity is, is fascinating to me because yes, it's true that uh, creativity involves brain, large scale brain networks. This old left brain versus right, right brain dichotomy is, has broken down. However, um, there is some interesting research showing using TDSC, showing that if you uh, inhibit, uh, you know, transcranial direct stimulation, if you 
turn down the current on the language centers, people are better at insight problems. And and that's that's so interesting. And I wonder, has anyone ever looked at the linkage there with dyslexia? Like, could it be? I sound like ancient aliens, you know, the TV show National Geographic. Could it be aliens? No, could it be that um, that that the unique brain configuration of people with dyslexia that the that language some people argue that language is oppressive you know to our creativity you know and our ability to make insights it gets in the way you know um could it be that people like jack are are more creative and insightful because of his unique brain configuration linked to dyslexia i think according to this the evolutionary theory of dyslexia i think it's very very possible like uh, something similar to what I said with Norm Geshwin's idea many decades ago it has not been proven, but I think it's interesting. But for example, when you look at dementia patients and Bruce Miller from UCSF and others have done kind of interesting work where if they have some focal kind of dementia and atrophy in their brain that, that it kind of unleashes creativity and there's a couple several papers on this topic. So it does kind of in the aging population, there has been some work and, and cases on these that's uh, been done in California and other places, but it is very exciting to think about this. And it really makes me think that we should be doing this. I know Dyslexia Center at UCSF is doing some where they're bringing in talented people and scanning their brain. Um, Jack Horn, Jack, if you're interested, we definitely would love to see your brain if you haven't been invited yet. Pull it out, Jack. Um, Maybe Scott also, you might qualify if you show your, t <laughs> if you show some dyslexia like traits, but um, so there are people who are interested. Unfortunately, it's not the area where NIH and other kind of major funders support. We'd love to appreciate any foundations who might be interested in these topics and we'd love to do more research on this. But, but um, we have done some work on um, stealth dyslexia, for example, I know that comes up quite often and others, but I'd love to hear what Jack thinks about whether he thinks it was because he felt that other people where you didn't feel that you were doing well and you felt like you struggled and failed and, and kind of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. You believe in that aspect or you feel like, like there was something that I felt different and kind of I could come up with solutions in different ways that other people didn't. I mean, looking at your research, it makes me think that your creativity is just has to be there for innately, but I might know. Well, you know, I, I, uh, one of the things that I tell my students and I, and I don't want it to sound, I, I, it, it could come out sound, sounding wrong. Like I'm, like I'm aloof or something or, or but I, I oftentimes tell my student that my students that if you do it first, you don't have to read anything, right? So, so, so really, if you're working on if you if you can find a project that that nobody really has thought about, and 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 you know, an interesting question um, that you know you really do not have to read a bunch of stuff, and and us just you know, I mean, I I. Reading is the hardest thing I do in my life. And to be a research scientist, you know, where you're supposed to read a bunch of stuff, I have found that, you know, if I have a project that nobody's ever done before, that's a lot less reading. So, so I have a, I have know, a I, funny story about that one, but go ahead and please finish. Well, I mean, uh, you know, so dinosaur eggs, I, you know, dinosaur eggs, people had found dinosaur eggs for, you know, a hundred years, and yet no one had ever found a dinosaur embryo, and and come to find out, you know, people thought they were precious. They thought the egg was precious, and so nobody had ever opened one up. And so, I I got to be the first person to find a dinosaur embryo, just because I had a hammer, and I wasn't afraid to break it open, and I did. I mean, I just broke it open and. Well, I broke a few of them open and before I found my first embryo, but you know, glue is cheap. You just glue it back together if it's not in there. So, but you know, people just hadn't realized that they actually could do that. Hey, okay. Are there dinosaur embryos that can still grow to? No, no, no they just <laughs> <open. laughs> Wouldn't that only, be cool? Only in, only in Jurassic Park. I was going to say, wouldn't that be <laughs> amazing if like you actually, we discovered that there was an embryo that was preserved and, 
ice oh, and could I make another movie. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I tend to blur reality and, and fantasy. So I was like getting excited that this might actually be a possibility. Um, you were advisor on Jurassic World, right? Uh, all uh, Jurassic Park movies. All of them for the, the 93 one? Yep. So I've been, I'm obsessed with those movies. I read uh, some misconceptions about them. One is that um, Jurassic Park uh, raptors didn't hunt in packs. Isn't that true? Like that was mis, uh, that was mis, uh, actually, we, have, we actually have pretty good evidence that they did. Really? But, but there's a good scientific argument going on right now about that. Yeah. Well, there's I'm, a, I'm there, there, are, there are people who don't think that they did. And yeah. people like myself who think we have plenty of evidence that says we do, that they did. So it's actually possible they did. Um, if, if there was one dinosaur that out of all of them that you would love to have as a pet, which one would it be? Well, you know, my favorite dinosaur is Myasaura. That's the first one I named. The problem with it is, you know, it hatches out of its egg about 16 inches long and grows to nine feet long the first year. And then, you know, it, it's 35 feet when it's full grown. So they're hard to keep it. They'd be hard to keep as a pet. And a velociraptor is really small and, uh, you know, it'd make a nice pet, except it would eat your cat, your dog and all the neighbors. So, that might not be a downside. Yeah. You might not like your neighbors. You know, birds are dinosaurs, and we have my my wife and I have a parrot. So you know that they that's a dinosaur unto itself. So that's probably the best you can. That's they're small, <laughs> and they're not, they don't eat cats. Fair enough. Now you are you turn the argument on its head though, because you've argued. Um, that just reading is overrated in general, like, you know, Absolutely. and, 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 and we ask you, you know, some questions like dyslexia, like how, you know, a lot of people, uh, what are the educational interventions to help people with dyslexia? You're like, I want to teach people to be dyslexic. So exactly. you, you have literally, you have turned the whole question on its head. You are the definition of creativity, which I love. I think you're, you're so cool. Um, I, I, think it's, I think it's interesting. I think it's good that, you know, kids learn how to read the best they can in grade school or where, you know, wherever it is. But then as you get older, you know, I think thinking is just more important. You know, I mean, less reading, more thinking. Right. And, and, and I would add, and I agree, I agree in my research on imagination, less imagination. So not just thinking, but. Right. Using, yeah, yeah, use your imagination. The default mode network. What is the relationship between the default mode network and dyslexia? Uh, Fumika, have you looked into that? We have not looked into it. I don't think there's any reports on it. Um, unfortunately, I think there's some interest and in, we talked about it. Uh, it's easy to look at, um, but we have not looked at, which makes me think that I should take notes and go back and look at it. Yeah. Did yeah. you want to explain what the default mode network is to other people and the significance of it? Retrieve network. Um, it, it, it incorporates uh, three major subsystems that work together as a team. That's why it's called a network um, with mental simulation and spontaneous internal generation of cognition, or I just call it the imagination network. It's a fancy way of, you know, um, it involves perspective taking, it involves a mental simulation of yourself in the future. Um, but I don't think it's, it's, uh, it's necessarily very language heavy because the precunius is a big part of it and that's visual spatial right uh, it's not definitely not language oriented so I, I would love to know what jack's precunius looks like i bet it's up the kazoo in terms of act in terms of activation okay. <laughs> yeah yeah um so we'll love, love the default mode network um so jack i really like this perspective you have so uh, what would that mean in terms of shifting the whole education system because see this is interesting a lot of people ask the opposite question they say well how can we take um, a, a square pig and put it uh, into a round hole I, I, I'm, I'm bad with my metaphors but how can we take something that doesn't fit and how do we force it to fit into an education system I'm getting that I'm feeling your vibe is more well I think we need to change the education system to correct me if I'm wrong but to right. accommodate the brilliance of why not accept the way the person is already, you know, and help them self-actualize? I mean, that's my jive. That's my uh, vibe too. 
Um, do you want to elaborate at all on, on what, what, how you, if you could, if I gave you $5 billion to change the education system, what you would do? You know, the education system needs changing anyway, because, you know, we've got basically all of the information we need is on our phone now. And, and so, you know, go to a school and they're just giving you the same information that you get off your phone. I mean, there's, and in fact, the information on your phone is more up to date than the information that your teacher can give you. And, and so, you know, there's no reason for, for schools to just be giving information now. They need to be show, you know, teaching you how to use that information and, and how to find that, how to get a hold of that information. That's, that's really what we should be learning. Um, but also, you know, rather than, I mean, I, I encourage my students, rather than read a book about somebody's adventure, write your own adventure. I mean, I just think it's, you know, I, yeah, there's lots of really good books out there. People do write books. They should be read by somebody especially the people that like to read, but the rest of us that don't like to read, we should be out there writing. I'll call a friend. Yes, agreed. I don't know if you can hear my Alexa talk. Oh, okay. She tells me to take a what walk. Did, what did she say? Uh, it's 1.38 p.m. and I have her uh, program to tell me, Scott, it's time to take a walk, go for a stretch or call a friend. <laughs> um, I, I have no way of turning that off. Um, but yeah you were on a roll you were uh, that was beautiful and i'm very curious to hear perspectives from parents in the room i think now's a good time to open this up if it's okay with you two if we can really um, open up to the the questions from um people who joined us today are there any i'm curious are there any parents on the call today where your child um is is it has dyslexia is maybe struggling in uh in terms of how to fit in in a school system that's that's so leading heavy um uh, Tova Cooper says yes. Um, do you do you all have any specific uh, questions? Okay, can you hear the question? Can you speak to problems of cognitively diverse adults in an organizational setting? Have either of you two thought about um, dyslexia in organizational setting, um, both in terms of helping the individual with behavior seen as negative and helping other members negative reactions? So dyslexic adults. Yeah, I think um, some of the things that people in some organizations are doing is self-advocacy, I think, um, and how to train individuals with dyslexia so they can self-advocate for themselves to kind of make other people understand their strengths as well as um, kind of different difficulties so people can support each other. Everyone has strengths and everyone has weaknesses. Some people are very sloppy, but very has creativity. And some people might be very detail oriented, but can't come up with new ideas. And I think it's the same sort of idea. And some people call it neurodiversity. Some people don't like using that term, such as researchers, but um, it's uh, so th there's one aspect of that. I think the other aspect, and you know, we're doing research into this, is the concept of stereotype threat that we talked about uh, that you know, we have to realize that if you are surrounded by people who have this negative stereotype about someone or a group of individuals, those individuals might underperform. So educating the people around them is very, very important, which if it's in a professional setting, it could be the HR's job or whatever it might be, or a diversity officer and these kind of things. And I think with the Black Lives Matter and other kind of movements, I think it's very, very becoming active to kind of a accept everyone and, and kind of very being mindful of each individual's unique characteristics. But uh, I think it comes in, on both sides. I'm sorry? Dyslexic lives matter. We need another hashtag. <laughs> yeah, or neurodiverse minds, uh, divergent minds matter um, as well. Um, so you hinted on stealth dyslexia earlier and pe you left people on the edge of their seat. Can you, can you tell us what that term even means and what your research showed? So I'll try to be brief because I could talk about each one of these topics for hours, but um, stealth dyslexia was first coined in 2005 by Brock and Fernette Ides, and they're up in Washington. I, I think they're still up 
up there. And they wrote a nice book on uh, sort of giftedness or the four reasoning, uh, four R's and kind of strengths that they might have. Um, and it was pretty popular at the time, so several years ago or a decade ago or so. And um, but uh, and then there was a New York the a New Yorker article where I was interviewed where I talked about self dyslexia in the research community. We call it. I'll get to the definition, but in the research community, we often sometimes call it resilient dyslexics, which I use in the research setting or compensated dyslexics. But basically what it is, is that you have the characteristic dyslexia characteristics, which is difficulty specifically in reading, but also, so if you think about the mechanics of reading, you have the decoding piece that you need to read and decode the words to be able to comprehend. And the ultimate importance of reading is understanding, comprehension, right? So even if you can decode, if you can't comprehend, those are sometimes called hyperlexics and, and you see often or sometimes in autism, that's, um, that's a problem because you only, the ultimate goal of reading is to comprehend, but it's the opposite. So you have problems in reading, but you're really good at reading comprehension. So that's basically the idea behind stealth dyslexia or resilient dyslexics. And uh, we've done some research into this some people think um, it was speculated and the ID speculated that they might be um, good problem solvers. They might have dyslexia and have problems reading, but they might be use a lot of these kind of frontal part of the brain and problem solving skills and it might be enhanced in those individuals. That leads them to kind of reading comprehension kind of superiority in a way. And so we looked at kind of the brain mechanisms underlying this. And what we found was it was very unique. The more differences they had or dissociation. So the more stealth they were or resilient they were, we found stronger or bigger in our case, um, prefrontal cortex. And it was the part of the brain that's really important uh, we found out that it was important that was connected to other parts of the brain, like the frontal parietal, and it's important for memory and cognitive control. And some people attribute that area to problem solving. Some people call it the executive director of the brain. So it's like the master orchestrator of the brain, um, this network. And what we found was that part seemed to be stronger or bigger in individuals who had more, who were more stealth dyslexic. Just, so just to clarify, that was in the dorsal region because the default mode network is also technically part of the prefrontal cortex, but that's the... It's more of the dorsal it, part, the outside part and the frontal the, just around here. The, the dorsal part. That's we published this a couple of years ago. It's interesting because uh, for, on average, dyslexia, a common theme is dis, uh, uh, executive function, dysfunction, executive dysfunction among those um, with dyslexia. So that's interesting. That uh, that's a unique a unique brain configuration that you've discovered there. Uh, I'm a parent of a profoundly gifted dyslexic and dysgraphia child. What ways can we impact our educational system to benefit the neurodiversity we need in our society? I mean, that's a very lofty question. Obviously, do you have any thoughts on racial ed? What do you say? Spatial ed. Well, that's interesting. Instead of special ed, spatial right. ed. Exactly. See, you want to turn the whole thing on its head and make the neurotypical, the neurodiverse. <laughs> exactly. Precisely. <laughs> I just love it. I love it. Um, so a lot of the, yeah, people really like the spatial ed concept. Um, Although someone spelled the word spatial wrong, I think. No, did they? Maybe they didn't. No, maybe I did. <laughs> yeah. I um, think it is not spell spelled correctly. I think you need a T there. Right? Am I right? <laughs> yeah, I'm not going we might crazy. be all, I'm not going crazy, right? Like we I'm, might be all dyslexia wannabes here, but yes. Potentially. Um people really um no, is it spatial with a T? Am I going crazy? Why is everyone doing it with a C? Yes, I think it's with a T. I'm pretty sure it's with a T. I, I love the audience here. Oh my gosh. Um, but I think there's some other questions. I don't know if you want to cover, if you're trying to co cover everything. I know there's something on distance learning, something on others. And distance learning kept coming up over and over again by this. And I kept, and I asked her if she, uh, if she would please, um, to Tova, can you please elaborate on what your question about distance learning was? Because you said, my son is eight and creates epic poetry off the top of his head but only verbally. He's a very tough time reading and writing. Please address the distance learning question. 
but I, I, I scrolled up and I couldn't find the distant learning question. I so, think it was very much toward the beginning. It is Arlene's question above. How can we help our dyslexic children who are struggling with distance learning? Okay, there we go. How can we help our, so let's address this because we're in this age of COVID. Um, so much of it is virtual and online. Do you two see opportunities for dyslexics to, maybe it's even good, it's like good for them, you know, that in the, in this sort of situation, or is it harder for them? What, what, what do you, what are you, are you, what are you seeing during this time? COVID and dyslexic individual students? Uh, so we have a national science funded project and it answers, I think, one of the other questions questions that they had, someone had, on what can they do for um, a dyslexic child during this period of time. So just FYI, I'm not going to go into details because I don't want to waste time on promotional sort of content, but we have a National Science Foundation funded project. If you look for the, if you contact me or Haskins, I, I'm sure, I think you can put it on the website later because I saw resources page on your Bridges, web, uh, Bridges Academy website, but, um, and I can post the link there, but we have a project called Project Rescue, for, and it's for entering kindergartners to second graders. If you're interested, we have a computer adaptive reading program and we have free progress monitoring that's going on that they can start as a gamified sort of program. Hopefully it's fun and they can do it at home to progress in reading during this time. I know it's really hard for some people who are receiving learning specialist attention and IP kind of um, accommodations during this time during COVID. Um, so I think that's one thing. I know there's a number of different resources. I'm happy to post those for those individuals with um, dyslexia and that might be helpful and that I found helpful that I share with other families as well. So that's one piece. I think it's, I've heard, uh, I've heard um, that social emotionally, it's actually beneficial. So the bright spot is that I've heard some positive stories that um, distance learning has been good for the child because they don't have to experience a stereotype threat that they're going to be pointed at any time and there's less reading out loud and those kind of things right now. So I've heard some positive stories about this. I think the majority though is struggling because they're not receiving the small individualized attention, especially if you go to public schools because it's not fair to do small and um, small group instructions when you have to address the needs for everyone, for example. So it's um, it gets really harder. I think um, when you look at some of these, join some of these webinars for distance learning and everyone's doing this, um, great organizations are hosting this. Everyone talks about small group uh, as to recommendations for teachers, hold small group instructions, use breakout rooms in Zoom and other things. Um, but it's, it's really hard, it really does um, come down to parents' availability of time and interest and how they can be proactive. And, and um, but uh, I will post some uh, websites that I found interesting related to COVID, including the statistics and how children who are in special ed or under-resourced areas might be severely impacted and the concerns around it as well. Thank you, this is, this is fantastic. Um, I'm actually curious the difference a lot of other people are curious about this as well. The difference between dyslexia and dysgraphia. So just briefly, uh, I know we don't have too much time to go into any details for any of them, but dyslexia is reading problems. Dysgraphia, graph is the act of writing. The problem with dyslexia or dysgraphia is that with dysgraphia, you have many different kinds. If you have spelling problems, so if you, the more most basic one is writing problems. If you can't write and if you have motor kind of fine motor issues, you might have dysgraphia. If you have spelling issues, even though it's, you can easily imagine that it's completely different brain mechanisms underlying it, you still have dyslexia. If you you have written expression problems, you still might be diagnosed with dysgraphia. And those are very different things. Reading difficulties or reading disorders, same thing also. If you can't decode, and if you can't read and comprehend the content, it could be all lumped into reading problems and put in the same sort of special support. And then you can't really individualize this, but they are highly related. They're highly comorbid. I think the statistics probably is around 40 to 6% in terms of the um, um, literature. Um, and it's a lot more than coincidence, but there's so much comorbidity or co-occurrence. Co-occurrence with math problems, co-occurrence, there's different theories behind this, writing problems, attention problems, ADHD, they're all much higher than the general statistics. And usually the number is around 40% comorbidity. And um, it's really hard to tease apart and the science is not quite there yet. And then what's dyscalculia? 
uh, math problems. Is there is there a comorbidity there at all with dyslexia? Some people say that it's up to 60% or up to 50%. The precise number is not known. But of course, math disabilities is also very, very diverse. It, maybe it's rote memory type two plus three is five. They might struggle with those. And some people think that's more related to dyslexia because of the phonological sort of aspect. And then it could be math reasoning, which is more related to comprehension. And it could be calculation, which is kind of more dif uh, different and might be more related to visual spatial, for example. So for each of these, I think they're dissecting these based on the educational system and it's not doing it based on the brain system. So if we can be more brain-based organized in terms of the education system and align it, I think we could potentially have um, great solutions in the future, but that's my personal opinion. More Legos. More Legos, I love it. Kids have need more Legos. Yeah, everybody should. That's what we should just make sure all the kids have Legos. Do you have it in your car right now? A box I, of Legos. I thought I you carried it around all the time. I've got one of the biggest Lego collections in the world. I think. <laughs> wow, we might have to compete and compare notes sometime. Incredible. By the way, I got almost blacklisted from the world headquarters of Lego because. I said Legos, and, and technically it turns out that the plural of Lego is Lego bricks, but there's no such thing as Legos. Oh. I've been saying it my whole life as well, and I was in the headquarters, and they're like, oh, no, we didn't. Just say Legos. So and, uh, anyway, I thought I would, a little trivia, a little Lego trivia. <laughs> I think just finish off this question. Can I just answer this dysgraphia and why dysgraphia and written expressions combined? I think, again, it's back to the educational system. And I'm not here to criticize. I think it's, it's a good system that's there for a reason. I think it could be changed, but it's also kind of hard without evidence and moving forward. But it's because writing classes are all lumped together. So anything that's related to writing gets lumped into dysgraphia. Reading classes are all lumped together. So anything that's related to reading, even though the brain mechanism, if you think about it, is completely different probably for these systems and um, they get lumped together. And so same for math. So I think instead of going for writing, reading, math, I sometimes talk about we should dissect it completely differently and orthogonally and go by brain systems of kind of uh, phonological mapping, memory system, um, kind of this expression and creativity and these kind of more high level cognition. And they could be different classes in different ways. I'd love to, Scott, maybe you should build a school with Jack that goes that way in a different, completely different way. Brilliant. And and, the, and there's no such thing as, as special ed. There's spatial ed, there's um, music ed, you know, it's just, just different eds, um, no special. Ed, um, so I, I believe we only have five minutes left. Is Chris? Is that right? Is that roughly correct? We only have five minutes left. Yes, that's correct. If that's the case, um, I want to just make sure I ask this because it is becoming it, it has become so apparent to me the importance for uh, more science on this topic and less. Um, I, I don't know the word for it, but you see in educational circles, conjecture, there's a lot, that's the word I'm looking for. You see a lot of educators think they know the answer. You know, they'll say, well, here's my dyslexia program, you know, and it's not science backed at all. Do you see that in, 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 in when you step into the educational circus, circles, are there any misconceptions that you see that you, you see things being prop, prom, promulgated within the dyslexia community that you don't think is on a strong scientific foundation yet? Um, I think it might be more related to, I'm kind of thinking about the question, um, the answers. I know I can come up with many of them, but just in this brief, I'm not very good with pressure and time pressure here, but um, uh, possibly relate, uh, related to education system more broadly, learning profiles often comes up. Yeah. I think that's kind of, a, it's an unproven, I think that there's, I don't, I, I don't like either side. So people who go gun ho about learning profiles and saying we have to teach to their learning styles, I think that's a misconception because there's no science behind it. But then there's also these researchers who are saying there's no such thing as learning styles. There's It's all bad, it's all fake and, and so on. And I think that's an extreme as well because we, our brains are all different. There are preferences to our learning 
styles or whatever you want to call it. I like doing things through hearing, for example, and some people would love to read things. And I love making graphs for everything. And people say, I don't understand graphs and you have to write out that paragraph and explain it to me. And so there's people have preferences, whether that matches with their brain organization is a different question. And we're starting to answer some of these with our Oak Foundation and NIH funded projects, but it's gonna take a while for it to kind of, and I'm sure with everything else, it's somewhere in between and it's this balancing act. And um, strength-based approaches is another one that's uh, interesting. Left brain, right brain kind of issues always come up. I think there's always two extremes. I always tend to be kind of the, I think there's something to be said about both sides. Wonderful. And Jack, um, you wrote an autobiography, is that correct? Uh, well, I, I guess you could call it that. Mm -hmm. What's it? Uh, what's the book called? Oh, it's 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 not a book. It, it's a. Um, I'm writing one. I am writing one. A book, autobiography. Now, I wrote a. I don't know. It was just like a chapter. Could you share that chapter or tell people how they can purchase it? Uh, you can't purchase it. It's on. Uh, I, I don't even know. It's, it's on uh, a thing called the Montana Professor through the University of Montana. Because people want to want to want to read this. So but the book the book is coming along. I'm okay. It's 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 uh I'd, I'd say half it's it's definitely half finished, probably a little more. But I don't know. How do you finish an autobiography other than you know kicking the bucket? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you have a lot of people who want to see the movie version of your life as well as the the book. So uh, we have to get you connected to someone in Hollywood, maybe a Jurassic, you know, the Jurassic Park folks can make a movie of your life and have dinosaurs in it. Yeah. I am remiss that I didn't have more time today to nerd out with you about dinosaurs. Um, but I, I've been controlling myself very much because I wanted to respect, you know, the scientific discussion. But I have like, I want to talk about raptors, I want to talk about the T-Rex and all the ways the T-Rex has been depicted and what's the real T-Rex look like. But I have lots of questions, but I just really want to thank um, both of you so much for uh, for gracing us with your uh, with your presence today and, and helping everyone uh, learn more about dyslex the dyslexic mind. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you, Chris and Stephanie for making this happen behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you to all of those who have uh, joined us today. Uh, keep your eye on TuiNews.com uh, for um, information about our September uh, webcast, which will feature Dr. C. Matthew Fugate, who's an assistant professor at University of Houston, whose research um, is in um, the relationship between working memory and levels of uh, creativity, gifted students who have characteristics of ADHD. He's also examined the coping mechanisms of uh, twice exceptional girls in secondary school as they navigate both their academic studies and their interpersonal relationships. So thank you everybody so much again and have a good evening. Bye, stay away from the T-Rexes. <laughs> <laughs>